Well, good afternoon. Good evening to you. 506 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. To help make a sense of the help make sense of the country, we'll join be joined by Dr. Victor Davis Hansen coming up at 5:30. You can help us make sense of it all too by calling 888-630-9625-888-630 WMAL. There is a fascinating story developing this week. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Gal Luft, who is a longtime Washington insider, featured routinely on cable news as a subject matter expert on national security and foreign policy. He's with an organization called the Institute for the Analysis of Global Security, which was founded by Robert McFarland, former national security advisor to Ronald Reagan, and James Woolsey, the former CIA director under Bill Clinton. This guy, central casting as a Washington insider, is now saying that he's got the goods on the Biden family, and as a result, he believes he's being prosecuted by the Biden Department of Justice. I'm going to play a little video, a little of the audio for you, and then I want to bring in our guests to assess this. Here's Dr. Gal Luft, who is um, laying out who he is. My name is Dr. Gal Luft. For the past 20 years, I have been the co-director of the Institute for the Analysis of Global Security, a Washington-based think tank focused on energy security. For the past 15 years, I've been a resident of Israel, and for four years, I was senior advisor to the China energy company CFC, at the same time of its dealings with the Biden family. Under normal circumstances, I would be testifying before Congress about my experience with CFC. Sadly, due to circumstances I shall describe here in this video, uh, I am forced to tell you this story via video. Yeah, he's uh, doing this from an undisclosed location. The, ver the video first shared by Miranda Devine at the New York Post with The World this week. Uh, and uh, he lays out in detail about how he told Justice Department officials in March of 2019 in a meeting in Brussels all about the Biden family's business arrangements with China, CEFC. He says they didn't follow up with him, but then they sought to prosecute him. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in Ed Morrissey. He's the managing editor at Hot Air. He's been following the details closely. Ed, great to have you with us, sir. No, oh, thanks for having me on. Kind of a fascinating new addition to this saga, and uh, you've noticed some interesting things about this story. Well, there's, I mean, first off, it, you know, this is not testimony, right? So, I mean, we're just going to put this caveat up here to begin with. This is a video that's being, that's, that's been prepared for, you know, for whatever motives that are behind this video it's not testimony under oath right so just to get those caveats out of the way uh, however uh, dr. Luft in this um, raises a lot of very interesting questions about why there wasn't more interest in what he had to say about the Biden's and CEFC and, and this is in March of 2019 right this is before Biden even announced for the presidency he was out of office at that time so I mean technically he was private citizen right now some of this some of the allegations go back to the time of his vice presidency but at the, that particular moment in time he was um, uh, not in office and dr. Luft says that he was uh, that he had briefed six people from the Department of Justice four FBI agents including the FBI agent who signed the subpoena for Hunter Biden's laptop at that repair shop um, and then two prosecutors uh, from the Department of Justice. One of them was uh, Catherine Ghosh. I, I forget who the other one was. But, you know, obviously prominent people within the Department of Justice and talked to them about, you know, these large money transfers between CEFC and the Bidens. And, um, and according to Dr. Luft, anyway, he said that he was able to, you know, tell them or show them that Joe Biden was part of those conversations, part of those, those transfers. Uh, now, that would be acting – because CEFC, by the way, just to, just to recap that, CEFC was a quasi-private organization in China that was well-known to the FBI as a front for Chinese intelligence. And this is something that John Schindler has written about over at the Washington Examiner. John Schindler is a, is a uh, counterintelligence expert who worked in counterintelligence for a lot of years – and he uh, he provides sort of freelance analysis. I think he's more or less regular at the Washington Examiner now. And uh, so he talked about that when all of this started coming out. So if you've got 
a former vice president and the family being connected to a front for Chinese intelligence by somebody who is was part of the commercial uh, ventures of the Biden family. Uh, and that really should grab some attention. It was a reason why six members of the Department of Justice went to Brussels to be briefed by him. Mm-hmm. But then nothing happens. Nothing happens at all, according to Dr. Luft. Nothing happens at all until they get the um, – until they get the, um, well, not even after they get the laptop, because the laptop is in October of 2020. Nobody contacts him for over three years. And then suddenly, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry just, a, just a quick correction, I think. Uh, the October 2019 is when the FBI establishes that the laptop is authentic, based on Gary Shapley's testimony. It's That's December correct, yeah. of 2019 that they take custody of the laptop, the same year that uh, that that Dr. Luft relayed these allegations, but he had done it months earlier. He did it March of that March. year. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. It was 2019. I'm thinking of when it was when the New York Post exposed it, right? Which right. Was in October of 2020. So you're right. This is in late 2019, and nothing and happens. They never get back to him. Never. And that's a common theme in this Hunter Biden saga. Tony Bobolinsky said the same thing. He wants he had an extensive conversation. He was a he's a business partner to Hunter Biden. He said he was at these dinners where Joe Biden was in attendance. He said a thousand percent. The big guy is Joe Biden, he says, with all the certainty in the world. He says he laid all of this out for the uh, FBI investigators in t- late 2020, told them what was going on. Uh, and they never once got back to him. This is a very troubling trend in these stories. A very troubling trend. And now we have to skip forward really three years, right? Because it's October 2022, and the IRS has been investigating Hunter Biden for you know felonious tax evasion now for three years, right? Because the, the laptop was part of that that um, investigation, part of that conversation. Right. And that's when they discover, that's when David Weiss tells Gary Shapley and the other IRS investigators that he is not the person who makes the decisions on filing charges. He has to work through two other U.S. attorneys, which were Biden appointees, who have both refused to file felony charges against Hunter Biden. They want to wrap this up with just some misdemeanor charges. And this is the first time that Chapley and the other IRS investigators have heard that he is not the final word on whether charges are going to be filed. It's because Merrick Garland had said, had told Congress, David Weiss has plenary authority to make those decisions. Weiss said in October 2022, no, we don't. Three weeks or four, excuse me, four weeks after that meeting, which was on October 7th, the um, Department of Justice Un, uh, yeah, unseals an indictment against Gal Luft for you know failing to register as a foreign agent, as well as arms trading, which Luft denies he's ever done. Uh, having never gotten back to him on any of the issues regarding uh, regarding the, the Bidens and their commercial interests and their connections to uh, Chinese intelligence fronts, and so it looks very strange. This whole Nexus in October and November of 2022 looked very strange, like they wanted to seal off the whole issue of Hunter Biden and get it out of the way. Now, I yes. mean, that was that was like eight months ago, nine months ago, right? So, so it took them a while to to put well, together the, the the plea deal, but it looked like they were basically setting the stage for it in October and November by by denying Weiss any opportunity to file char- file felony charges. Yes. And apparently, at least according to Dr. Luft, uh, making sure that they got him out of the way so, by painting him as an arms dealer. So here's you know, a couple a couple of things here. Let's, let's stipulate for a moment that Gal Luft is guilty of something uh, that's, that runs afoul of criminal law. N- normally, if you had a, a suspect who committed crimes, but you can use that suspect to potentially catch a much bigger fish, wouldn't you negotiate something with Gal Luft? Like, okay, look, we've got you dead to rights on these crimes, but man, if you can take down the Biden family for us, that would make that would make a prosecutor's entire career. That'd be a huge deal. Let's let's negotiate immunity. Let's negotiate a settlement. Let's negotiate some sort of plea deal. Uh, And instead, the Biden administration is sicking the forces of the government on hunting this guy down around the planet. 
Uh, and he's and he says in this video that he may be on the run for the rest of his life. Yes. Now, I think that might be a little dramatic. He might certainly be on the run until January 2025, depending on what happens in the election next year. Sure. But um, but I, I want to put this a little bit in perspective, too, because I mean, you can say, well, look, we've got, you know, a, a presidential son who's a ne'er-do-well, who's, you know, admittedly a ne'er-do-well. He's He's been a constant problem. And. Uh, you know, it, all this was was some tech stuff and a, and a felony gun charge, which they would sock anybody else with at least three years in prison. And there's all sorts of examples of that that have come out since this plea deal was announced. But this is an arms dealer. This is an arms dealer. you got to get arms dealers out of the way. And that might be a compelling argument if they hadn't traded an arms dealer for Brittany Griner, for a WNBA star who – admittedly carried cannabis into Russia, which is right. a stupid thing to do in any, at any point in time, but certainly while there's this conflict going on between the U.S. and Russia over Ukraine. Yes. I, you know, Victor Bout was the worst of, uh, you know, of the, um, of, of the arms dealers, and they traded him away for Brittany Griner. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so it's hard for me to credit, well, you know, this guy's really bad. He's an arms dealer, so we can't, I mean, we can't cut him a deal. This is the kind of guy that we want to get, yes. you know, that we'd, we'd make what? a deal with Hunter to get him sort of thing. Um, and that would be compelling if it wasn't for the fact that they were trading away, you know, the uh, what, what's his name, the, the Lord of War? He's got a couple of different nicknames. Yes. Uh, you know, in order to, in order to uh, end a, an embarrassing PR debacle with the WNBA for the White House. So what strikes me as, as really interesting about this case, when it first came out that he was being, that they were unsealing this indictment against him, and Miranda Devine has been doing, as she throughout, such great coverage of all of the different pieces of the Hunter Biden and Biden family saga, what, what really caught my attention was that Gal Luft is not a fringe figure. He's not the mentally deranged person standing outside the White House saying the CIA is spying on him. He is right out of central casting for Washington establishment figures. He is a part of this long-running think tank. He's connected to uh, people from Ronald Reagan's administration, from Bill Clinton's administration. He's called upon on a routine basis to be on national television, to give his commentary on energy affairs around the globe. He seemed, he's a serious person, in other words, and he's making some very dramatic allegations now against the Bidens, and he's claiming that, that his perch as, a, as a, an advisor to this CEFC gave him access to all of this. I mean, this makes him, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if it makes him credible, but it certainly makes him a very relevant witness in this story. Yeah, well, it does. And this is the reason why the House Oversight Committee wants to depose him, right? I mean, they can't use the video. The video doesn't really cut it. You have to depose them. You have to have some sort of adversarial process in the deposition, you know, so that the Democrats and the Oversight uh, Committee can also interrogate them and ask him questions, have a cross-examination. I mean, that's, that's how it's done. Yeah. But you have to get him in a position where he can actually engage on that without fear of being hauled off and you know, stuck in a prison someplace where he can't talk to the House Oversight Committee, too. And so all of this going on at the same time is, is a little curious. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't necessarily rational explanations that that are you know, that that explain what the Department of Justice is doing here with this unsealed indictment, you know, one week before the midterms, and you know, three and a half weeks after, you know, David Weiss was basically shot down from uh, filing felony charges against Hunter Biden. Yes, but I don't know of I don't know of a whole lot of rational but, explanations that would cover all these bases. But you know? that Weiss thing, but even the Weiss saga, you've got Mer Merrick Garland and David Weiss himself being involved in an effort to suggest that that's not true, or at least spinning it. So uh, the amount of deceit that's going on is so thick that uh, unfortunately we're in an era where you can't um, uh, be too credulous about the Justice Department and their pronouncements. And that's part of the problem, right? I mean, Vince, this is what the issue is right now, is that the Department of Justice has become so politicized that, you know, 10 years ago, if somebody had, you know, posited this scenario, most of us would have laughed at it. We say, you know, that's not their job. They don't get right. involved like that. That's not what they do. You know, they're, 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 they would rather stay out of politics. They're really focused on 
you know, counterintelligence, especially in the post-9-11 world, and law enforcement, right? They're, they're no, they don't care what presidential sons and daughters are doing. They're, they're worried about what terrorists are doing and what criminals are doing. But those days are gone. I mean, those days started disappearing in 2015, 2016 with the Hillary Clinton uh, investigation. And then, you know, with Operation Crossfire Hurricane, those days were completely exploded. And you know, Michael Horowitz in his IG report, John Durham in his special counsel report, outlines just how politicized all of these things were and how the, the predicate for this was a lie and that everybody all the way up to Barack Obama had been briefed that it was a lie. Yes. Uh, except for the FBI investigators. James Comey knew it was a lie. It, he, knew, he was briefed in that meeting from John Brennan that this was a Hillary Clinton, um, you know, oppo research, you know, dirty trick. Yep. Uh, trying to distract from her email scandal by making it look like Donald Trump had connections to Russian intelligence as a sort of a counterweight to that. They were told that in August of 2016. And rather than come out and say, look, you know, we're hearing all these rumors. They're overstated. This is, this is, this is not something you have to worry about. What happened? Barack Obama went from saying, you know, our elections are secure. You have nothing to worry about to all of a sudden obsessing over Russian interference, right? Yes. Um, it, and, and that was after he was briefed that it was nonsense. So yep. you get the whole, the whole corrupt you know, bureaucracy there. And now there are many, 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 many very fine people who are trying to do their jobs at the Department of Justice. I'm, I am very much convinced of this. We're seeing very, very many fine people at the IRS that are trying to do their job, too, in this. Gary Shapley and the other people in there wanted to prosecute Hunter Biden for crimes that they would prosecute anybody else for. Uh, but they had to do it through the Department of Justice because the IRS does not prosecute crimes. Right. They, they assess civil fines, but they can't prosecute people for crimes. That's got to be done through the Department of Justice. So the IRS is doing the right thing, right? The Chaplin and his team are doing the right thing, and the Department of Justice is shutting them down and then retaliating against them when they try to blow the whistle on what's going on. So yeah, I... all, of this, all of this just says, look, this whole thing is corrupt. And there's no, there's, there's not a lot of other options here that cover the facts that are in front of us, other I know. than the fact that the people who are running this are corrupt. I'm sorry. We just, we just need, a, we just need a lot more Gary. Down. We need a lot more Gary Shapley's uh, very quickly uh, this, uh, for the good of our country. Uh, in the meantime, Ed Morrissey, thank you very much. We need a lot more Ed Morrissey's too, but there's only one. Ed, thank you so much. Good to talk to you today. Are the walls closing in on the Bidens? It's a big question. For the big answers, we turn to Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. He joins us next. Well, good afternoon to you. 535 here at Newstalk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us today, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. In many ways, this has been a very good week in America. Independence Day this week. A lot of big victories in the United States Supreme Court on behalf of American independence and on behalf of civil rights. The left is furious about all of it. For more on the state of the country right now, and also the uh, the Biden family specifically, I want to turn to Dr. Victor Davis Hanson. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute and the author of The Dying Citizen, How Progressive Elites, Tribalism, and Globalization Are Destroying the Idea of America. Uh, sir, great to have you back with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, did, did you feel any sense of optimism over the course of the past week with these the Supreme Court justices and particularly Judge Doty striking down um, the Biden administration's censorship of American citizens over these uh, uh, on social media companies? I, I felt like some good things happened this past week. Yeah, I think the whole month has been good with the affirmative action ruling and uh, independent choice of whether or not to take on jobs if you're a entrepreneur or business i think it's all good and that's the backdrop with the target the disney the anheuser bush the la dodgers you get the sense that both legally and de facto people are sort of coming to the conclusion that if this if this is to continue this being the progressive agenda we're not going to have a country and in every dimension people are starting to wake up and according to their station pull back a little bit Yes. Some, some good defenses of religious liberty last week by the 
um, by the Supreme Court as well. And in that sense, I feel like the flame of liberty is still burning in some places. Uh, and, and, that, and especially on the Supreme Court, we have, we have Donald Trump to thank is the reality for the current composition of the court. But uh, have you noticed this week that the left is once again talking about blowing it up? They want to pack the court uh, to, to get rid of all of that. Yeah, they, uh, they always talk about process, whether it's the electoral college or the composition of the court or the filibuster or adding new states or changing the way we vote or going from, you know, 30 percent showing up uh, on Election Day from a previous 70 percent. They, they don't have confidence in the electorate that their yeah. agenda will will you know, will please 51 percent of it. And so whether it's an open border or changing the process, they always search for something in lieu of their of popularity because nobody really wants what they have to sell. Right. And they don't think the rules really need to apply to them. And that that helps us segue really nicely into what's going on with the Biden family right now. Uh, the Biden family for years, quite obviously, according to the public record, has traded on their name in order to enrich themselves. And all of this seems to be in some ways catching up with the Bidens. You've got you've got a number of people who are now on the record making pretty dramatic allegations about bribery of the Biden family. You've got Tony Bobulinski back in 2020 talking about how this was all arranged. 10 percent for the big guy. He's a thousand percent certain that was a reference to Joe Biden. You have IRS uh, officials who have now become whistleblowers saying that the Biden administration has been in interfering in their investigation. Uh, and uh, even going back to the Trump era, there was interference in the investigation into Biden. Do you think this is all adding up to something? Yeah, I do. I mean, each one is a force multiplier of the other one. You had Joe Biden trying to explain every which way that when he bragged to the Council on Foreign uh, Relations that he had gotten a prosecutor fired. You could get away with that or you could get away maybe with Tony Bobolinsky or maybe you could get away with the IRS whistleblowers or maybe you could get away with a $10 million paper trail or maybe you could get away with the evidence of the Hunter lap. But at some point, the preponderance of evidence is just too much. And I think it's starting to dawn on the media and the left that this is a losing cause and they're going to go down with Joe Biden, at least credibility wise, if they continue. And then you have the other the other dimension, which is useful for them, that Joe Biden is non compos mentes and he's failing at a geometric rate, not arithmetically every week. And so I think they feel that, well, maybe now we can accept this narrative that he is corrupt and the family is corrupt and we can head off a, a general disaster for the Democratic Party by easing him out. So I think a lot of the leaking is sort of coming from the left and they feel that whether it's Gavin Newsom or whoever they want in, that these narratives that they fought tooth and nail, they're sort of passive about now. Yes. You know, it's interesting, too, to see the media's reception to all of this. You're beginning to see some questions from the press on uh, some of these Biden scandals. But, boy, you, you said preponderance of the evidence. You really uh, need to present a mountain of evidence before they'll even ask a single question about Biden. Meanwhile, uh, how many allegations against Trump that had no basis whatsoever tur were turned into multi-evening scandals on uh, some of these big newscasts? Yeah, and I think that's coming back to bite them because they, they set these precedents about what was legitimate to go after a president, to get a special prosecutor, to impeach a president twice, to, preach, to impeach a, a president and then try him when he's a private citizen. So they set a lot of precedents. And they really lowered the bar over what was permissible. And now I think they're thinking, you know what, we're, we're exposed in a way that we were with the filibuster and Supreme Court. We kind of hung ourselves on that. And so now there's really no institutional memory or protocol that's stopping the Republicans from doing whatever they want because they destroyed every type of cautionary pr uh, protocol there was in their hatred of Trump. And now... Biden, who has a lot more exposure than Trump ever could imagine, yes. I think. And I again, these questions today and yesterday about the cocaine issue, I, I don't I couldn't imagine they would have dared to ask those questions. Some of the people in the left wing press maybe six months ago or a year ago. So the fact that even they are curious about something that they would have just a, a few months ago, they've said, how dare you even mention this? 
but they're mentioning it now, and it, that's it's a very it's a changing atmosphere. Yeah, and and not, and by not for the, idealism, just for just for their own self interest. Sure. Yeah, uh, B- Biden has crossed some thresholds that that Donald Trump never did. There was all this debate about um, about whether Donald Trump had committed high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, that this nefar- this kind of nebulous. Uh, thing to pin down is so long. It wasn't even really criminal law. It was just a political question that was assessed in the House of Representatives as they pursued him for two impeachments. But with Biden, we get a very different situation because the impeachment clause of the Constitution uh, lays out not just high crimes and misdemeanors, but also treason and bribery. Bribery is is actually stated in the impeachment clause of the Constitution. It is. And here we have a, a full blown bribery scandal involving the Biden family. And then you have to sort of corroborate that with the fact that it's almost an inexplicable policy toward China because while they show proper venom, I guess, at Putin, but we, here we have the Chinese with the balloon incident, with the Wuhan lab, with buzzing our planes, getting too close to our ships, threatening almost, you know, really almost with the use of nuclear weapons vis-a-vis Taiwan. And this administration reacts to all of that. Well, we have to have closer relationships with China or we're not in competition or they're not that bad. And you think, well, they surely don't show that with Russia. I know Russia's in Ukraine, but it's only got 144 million people. It doesn't have 1.4 billion. It doesn't have the wherewithal that China does. So you, you, and you put all of this bribery stuff and accusations there, and you think, well, does China have something on Biden? That's a natural, because it's almost inexplicable that an American president would go would go to such lengths to deny what China is actually doing. I mean, a yes. million people died, and it's almost taboo to even ask, can you please tell us what happened at the Wuhan lab? We need to know, because a million Americans are dead. Or this balloon went across the, trans, the continental United States, and would you please tell us what happened? Or you're buzzing our planes, you're getting too close to our ships, you better stop. We don't hear any of that. No. And the two countries that happen to be right at the center of these bribery scandals are Ukraine and China. uh, And they just so happen to be the two most important countries in the international consciousness right now. Yeah. And they're the ones that this administration has, has had a very, has a trademark. And the one is you don't mention anything about tensions with China and you don't dare mention that we're giving essentially Ukraine's got the third largest defense budget in the world right now, $130 billion of U S transfers. And, you know, you can make an argument that we want to help the Ukrainians defend themselves, but some of this, this weaponry may or may not be used for preemptive strikes into Russia or on the black sea. And so they're giving us a level of exposure. We really haven't contemplated yet. You know, we're giving them the weapons, but if they use them, to stage weapons, which, you know, it's a legitimate consideration given their precariousness. But still, we didn't give the weapons to use inside Russia. Right. Because that's a uh, that's a matter between us and Russia. And yet the Biden administration is oblivious to it. At least it seems like it. They, they announced today that we are sending cluster munitions to uh, Ukraine. Um, these are this is the kind of thing that uh, all sorts of international treaties even ban uh, in the in use yeah. of war. Um, what is this in your view? Is this the kind of thing that will result in lives saved or is this going to escalate the conflict and more people will die? Uh, I don't know that answer, but I do know that it really hurts our credibility. For example, we had a protocol with Russia in Syria about airspace and they have been very aggressively trying to destroy our drones and they're not just drones they are huge million dollar predator type drones And yet we were outraged about that. But it's kind of strange to be outraged that the Russians are getting too close to our our, uh, drones in Syria when we're giving maybe cluster bombs that are going to maim and kill in in a way that we had always objected before, or that they're using drones repeatedly with the U.S. technology to stage uh, raids inside Russia, or maybe a a shortage ship missile spunk a Black Sea. Uh, Russian capital ship last year. So you can't have it both ways. You can't be arming Ukraine to the teeth to kill Russians inside Russia, even maybe, and then object that they are reacting in a childish way in Syria by getting too close to our 
our planes. We're getting to a point, and what I'm trying to say is that if we continue where we are, we're going to have a, a showdown with Russia. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be inevitable, and we're not prepared for that. It's hurtling at us at a very high pace, and, and the is. Biden administration policies here have been incoherent because they've spent much of the war claiming – that we can't send tanks because that's too escalatory. Then they send tanks. We can't send jets because it's too escalatory. And then they greenlit jet deliveries. And then they said we can't use cluster bombs because it would be too escalatory. Long range missiles. And every single time they keep crossing these thresholds that they said were unacceptable that would lead us to World War III. And here we are. So which version was correct? And it's, it's the same narrative that we you can't go from Barack Obama's appeasement of reset, where you overlook all of Russian aggression in 2014, and you try, and you're Hillary Clinton, and then you go flip 180 degrees when Donald Trump comes on the scene, and all of a sudden there's a Russian under every bed, and they're culpable for all of these fantasy collusion narratives. We're all false, and yet we kind of slimed all of Russia and said, you know what? They had a deal with Trump, and they were rigging the election. They didn't do that. And we know that from their Mueller and, and uh, other investigations. And yet the way the Russians must look at it is, well, at one point they wanted to reach out and be our best friends. And then all of a sudden they're ch claiming that we destroyed their election integrity. And that wasn't true. And, and they're just very volatile people. And what I'm getting at is not to excuse what Russia is doing, but in a right. realist sense, that's very dangerous if they have that view that, we're capable of 180 degree turns at any moment because they can interpret something that we're doing that we didn't mean to do as a, a strategic assault on them. And with given Putin's state of mind, I, I, I just don't understand why they just dismiss lowering this threshold on, on the talk about nuclear weapons. We've never seen talk as promiscuous since the Cuban Missile Crisis about the use of nuclear weapons. Yeah, I mean, at one point, Biden floated regime change. The White House had to quickly run that back. Uh, yeah. fi finally, um, Victor Davis Hanson, Dr. Victor Davis Hanson, so grateful for your time today. Uh, uh, Vladimir Zelensky said recently that uh, martial law is, is ongoing in the country. Therefore, uh, we may not have an election in 2024, referring to Ukrainian elections for, for who the next president would be. They would suspend elections in the country for the duration of the war. Uh, I mean, if you're the Biden administration and you've been telling everyone that the whole mission is to defend democracy, how can you defend this? I don't think you can. I mean, you're talking about the United States invaded. We had D-Day and Normandy invasion in June of 1944, and we had an election in 1944 in November. And Churchill was thrown out of office right when V2s were hitting uh, London, pretty much he lost power before the Alta conference. So you can't say that we're special and, and we have to get an exemption from election because Ukraine's under dire threat. And you're asking help from the two greatest benefactors of Britain and the United States who went through an existential World War II <laughs> and still conducted regular elections. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. And it's not going to it's not going to fall on sympathetic ears. Yeah. Uh, Vic Dr. Victor Davis Hanson, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today, as always, sir. Thank you. OK, this is awesome. D Donald Trump is campaigning today in Council Bluffs, Iowa. He stopped inside of a Dairy Queen. He bought everybody ice cream. And apparently everyone just kept asking for blizzards. You know, if you've ever been to Dairy Queen, you know what a blizzard is. By the way, the blizzard is, is, a, fun is a funny treat because... Uh, back in the day, at least I remember just being a kid getting a Dairy Queen Blizzard, and there's like more of a show too. They would turn the ice cream over and they would put it upside down. And if it didn't stay in the, if they didn't do the move or they held the ice cream upside down and show you that it stayed in the cup, uh, then you got it for free. So every time the the uh, the uh, cashier, the ice cream person, would hold it upside down and then they would hand it to you and it'd be like a big presentation. Nowadays, you go to these Dairy Queens and it's like people, they just like, they, they hold it upside down for literally a split second and they just hand it to you. Like, there's like no enthusiasm. Hey, come on. A little excitement with this ice cream delivery. How about that? Anyway, there was excitement today at a Dairy Queen in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, people were asking for blizzards and Donald Trump didn't know what blizzards were, so it led to this hilarious moment. Everybody wants a blizzard. <laughs> Everybody wants a blizzard. What the hell is a blizzard? He goes, whatever. They can have blizzards. Take care of the people. He says he points to everybody. And then he was hand-delivering blizzards uh, to the crowd.
Uh, so that was good. That, that was nice. That, that's a double whammy. That's cool. So you get some soft serve ice cream and you get to talk to the president of the United States. That's a pretty good day, I would say, in terms of just checking the box on, on exciting activities. Uh, let me see here. I've got Scott calling in from Castleton. He's on line two. Scott, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colonnade Show. Hey, Vince. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, yeah, segue into a great day. It was a great day today. Uh, it's been a crazy week. You've been working all kinds of crazy stuff, but um, <laughs> I love when you do the six hours. It's fantastic. You've done it before. I don't get a lot of work done <laughs> at work. Uh, thank you. That's a compliment. I, if I can distract you from your work, it's a, it's a good compliment. I appreciate it. I, my, always, my measurement for radio was always like, do I stay in the car when I get to my destination? That's the, that's the, that's the sweet spot. That is true. Uh, and I did it all the time. <laughs> it was just, you know, throughout the day, I just noticed that the theme of the Biden family relationship with China is everywhere from the cars yeah. to the you know, fossil fuel industry to the, you know, the economy, everything. We can get a military yep. benefiting China. Scott, it's a good point. A little breaking, uh, breaking up a little bit there, but Scott was making a really excellent point, which is it all goes back to China. Let me expand this a little bit. It goes back to all of the countries that bribed Biden. It just constantly works out to their benefit. How about that? I'll noodle on that over the weekend. You should too. Have a great one with your loved ones. The great one himself, Mark Levin, is up next.